The following is a special presentation of WEDU, Tampa, St. Petersburg, Sarasota. When you mix product information with a long commercial, what you get is an infomercial. Consumer Reports once called infomercials the Rodney Danger Field of Advertising because they don't get the respect they deserve. Ch -ch -ch Chia. Chia Pets, the pottery that grows. But in reality, the infomercial industry is an increasingly powerful force in sales and marketing, generating hundreds of billions of dollars a year in product sales around the world. You're about to meet an entrepreneur who's a pioneer in the fast-paced world of infomercials, next on the Suncoast Business Forum. There's no one exactly like you. No one has the same financial goals or cares about the same people. That's why Raymond James Financial Advisors have the independence to offer unbiased advice that's right for you. And it's why we pioneered the idea of financial planning. You might say we're just as unique as you are. Raymond James, individual solutions from independent advisors. What does it take to find a talented entrepreneur with a winning idea and then bring that idea to market? The odds of success are slim, but for more than 30 years, entrepreneur Kevin Harrington has beaten the odds by a wide margin. As a pioneer in the infomercial industry, he's marketed more than 500 products that have generated over $4 billion in revenue. His success qualified him to be one of an elite group of investors known as Sharks on ABC's hit program, Shark Tank. Kevin Harrington is the king of infomercials. His genius marketing of products has amassed billions of dollars in sales. Kevin, welcome to the Suncoast Business Forum. It's a pleasure to be here, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Now, you've spent your entire career evaluating entrepreneurs and their ideas and taking those to market. How did it feel to be one of those people who are picked as a shark, as an investor on Shark Tank, and evaluating those ideas in front of 7 million viewers a week? Wow. Well, it was a lot different. Um, you know, welcome to the world of Hollywood when I got involved with Shark Tank. Um, I had no idea how f fancy it really was going to be, but, but what I had to do was just focus on the product. And I said to myself, I do this every day. So, you know, I've been doing it, like you say, now 30 years, and I just focused on the entrepreneur. I forgot about all of that. So really, when it came to the deals and the people coming, it was the same for me, but I just had to forget about everything else that was surrounding me during the taping of the show. Over the three years, I did 175 segments on Shark Tank. Um, uh, did about uh, 20 plus deals on the show. And now, some of them don't happen because there's due diligence that's required, but of, of the deals that closed, yeah, I had a, a number of, of very successful projects. And that was what was exciting was getting somebody to walk in live. We didn't know what was coming. There was a curtain in front of us, and then they gave the pitch, and we had to make a choice to invest or not. <laughs> Rebecca, I look for two things. I look for a product that solves a problem and a mass market product. And I think this meets both of those. Every pet store in America will want this product if you put this on TV. That's what I do, and I'm interested in this deal. I had one business that grew all the way to about $5 million okay, in sales. Right. Thank you. I've looked at a lot of information about the size of the infomercial industry, and I've seen numbers anywhere from 100 plus million to 100 plus billion to 300 billion dollars. Do you have any idea of the scope of of the industry, and is it is it just TV, or is it broader than that? It's it's much broader. Actually, the, we call ourselves part of the electronic retailing industry, and that is a 300 billion dollar industry that includes TV, cable, the internet, sales on the internet, etc. So. Uh, it would include companies like QVC and Home Shopping Network, um, all of the infomercial companies, the, even the Amazon. So it's the electronic retailing industry is a huge industry, $300 billion a year. Now, it's not just limited to what you see on TV where people are out there promoting product and they're entrepreneurs. Infomercials are used by very large companies as well, isn't that right? Absolutely. You'll see, you know, uh, the Procter & Gamble's of the world have done infomercials, automobile manufacturers, financial companies. Um, you know, Church & Dwight is now a big company, um, 
Uh, they own uh, many brands, OxyClean, for example, which started as a you know Billy Mays product on Home Shopping Network and now became a $300 million brand. So um, infomercials have, have gone from you know, small-time invention products to hundreds of millions in, in branded companies. Now, you were there at the beginning. In 1984, you produced your first infomercial. You were in your 20s at the time, and this was just a fledgling venture. How did you come up with the idea to do that, and how has, how has the infomercial evolved? Well, it, it, it's, I was a young entrepreneur, full of curiosity, and I actually was a broker and sold businesses, and... Um, real estate and one day it's sort of a long story but I created the own your own business show and it was a 30-minute show selling Joe's pizza parlor and flower shops and delicatessens and all in 30 minutes like you see shows today where they shall sell real estate the homes we were selling businesses and that became very successful in a local market Cincinnati mm -hmm. and I was selling pizza parlors for a hundred thousand dollars on television and I thought well why not a knife set for $19.95. So we morphed it into products. And that transition was the big leap that got me into the business that I'm now in today because we started, once we started selling products, we could get credit cards from the sale and that changed the whole model because now before we bought the time and we took leads, but we didn't actually get money until the business sold. Now we were able to buy the media, cash the credit cards overnight and shipped the product and we were in the money literally within hours of airing the show. So whole different model and the industry has now since grown that virtually every industry uses infomercials. So in your 20s you were an entrepreneur, you pioneered infomercials. Let's talk about your upbringing though. Did you come from a family of entrepreneurs? Well, you know, my father was definitely an entrepreneur. Um, uh, my mother came out of, her father was in banking, uh, which was a great business and she actually was sort of anti the entrepreneur route, okay? So, um, in fact, when I w went to college, uh, I did go three years in college, but uh, I chose to be an entrepreneur. My father was a restaurateur, and, and he was an entrepreneur his whole life. So I think I skewed a little bit more towards my father in that regard because I started working for him when I was 11 years old in his restaurants and got a chance to really understand the nature of entrepreneurship. I saw the good and the bad and, and understood a little bit about what was going on. And he would always show me things and teach me, look for this and look for that. And I got enough of a, of a good feel for, for the fact that he could, you know, he ran the business. He owned it. He got the upside. But, you know, he had to work 80 hours a week, too. And that was the downside. Now, before you graduated high school, you also had several businesses of your own. Tell us about those. Well, you know, I was a young entrepreneur. I, I started a driveway ceiling business. I grew up in Cincinnati, so, you know, the cracks in your driveway, uh, when he got into the winter, when the water got in there and it got cold and they froze, the cracks expanded. So I would go to people, the house, knock on their door. Hey, look, I can beautify and protect the, your driveway. Seal the cracks, beautify it, driveway ceiling. And that was, for four years, a huge summertime business for me. I was doing um, 15 to 20 jobs a week uh, uh, at the age of 15 to about 17 years old. And then uh, I started a heating and air conditioning company the senior year of high school into college. And we were full-blown tri-state heating and cooling. We installed furnaces, air conditioning systems. And I had, uh, by, uh, by the end of the first year, we had done a million dollars in sales while I was in college, actually. So it was, you know, I had 25 employees. And you know, it was a successful little business. What did you learn from that and how did you move on? Well, heating and air conditioning was very labor intensive. We'd install it, now you needed service and, you know, well, something wasn't hooked up right. And I was a great salesman, but, you know, the installation and the service was the downfall of that business. So I wanted to be in a business where I could sell something and not have service. And that's why ultimately now the business I'm in, we sell, a, you know, if, if I sell a knife set, we can sell a million of them and have very few issues or problems. I mean, people, it's a sharp knife, it works, they like it, they keep it. It's a, you know, it's a clean business. Mm -hmm. I sold the heating and air conditioning business to one of my employees, and actually at that point, I had a little bit of cash to be able to look into what do I want to do now? And I was still a young man, I was in my lower 20s. I mean, this is, you know, uh, many years ago. So um, I searched to get into my next business at that point. Well, that's a great question. A lot of people in their early 20s search for a career. 
How did you find your calling? I fell into it because I was searching and looking at dozens and then hundreds of businesses. And I then said, you know what? There's many other people are doing exactly what I'm doing. So I got involved in brokering these businesses. And I said, until I find what I want, I just found a great business. It's not for me. I spent all this time analyzing it. And so I said, but maybe I could broker it and sell it. And so I created a brokerage company and right in Cincinnati. And we did... Um, we sold all at hundreds of listings of businesses for sale. So I got a chance now to see the inner workings and the books and the records and the, the profits, the losses, the percentages, the cost of goods, the cost of food, the cost of this, you know, the ups, the downs of all these different industries. And that was a good position for me to be in because I wanted to be able to pick then from there the business that I wanted to be in. And when the infomercial thing hit for me, I knew that was it. Well, was it related to the business brokerage? Well, th what happened was I was selling businesses through classified ads, and then I created a TV show that was the, the selling of the businesses, the Own Your Own Business show. So the TV show went up on cable television, and now you could see on TV Joe's Pizza Parlor and the delicatessen, a flower shop, and we were getting hundreds and hundreds of calls a week. About 400 calls a week were coming in from our TV show, just running on local cable, and I was spending so little for the media, because this was in the beginning days of cable, when they were practically giving the time away, and literally almost giving, I mean, less than $10 for a 30-minute show in, in my local area, but I was getting hundreds of phone calls. So my business, I very quickly saw the opportunity for this low-cost media. And well, that was the, the birth of my infomercial business. It seems like the stars were kind of aligned for you because the FCC had just deregulated advertising on TV and the cable industry was just getting started, didn't have enough content to fill the channels. I went to the cable networks and all the cable operators and said, that at midnight, a lot of these guys shut down and they were dark. And I said, why are you off at midnight? Because we can't afford the programming. So I said, I'll put some programs in your airtime and I'll give you a percentage of the sales. And that's when we started doing kitchen products and a product, one of my first big hits was this product called the Food Saver. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's been on TV now for you know about 28 years almost now. It's the longest running infomercial product out there. It's a vacuum food sealer that we launched back in the mid 80s. At this stage of my life, I said my mind was sort of in a curiosity overload, okay? So I used to go to the trade shows. And so I would go to this show and that show and I'd meet all these people and Food Saver was one of those products. I love talking about the trade shows. I mean, I met a gentleman named Arnold Morris and Arnold was selling a product called the Ginsu knife. And when he demonstrated this knife the first time I saw him, 10 people standing there, half the people bought a $20 knife set. And before I knew it, he had grabbed another 10 or 15 people and they were buying it. And that's when I said, turn the camera on, let Arnold pitch this to the camera, but he's, we're going to take it to millions of people. In Japan, the hand can be used like a knife. But this method doesn't work with a tomato. That's why we use the Ginsu. So Arnold Morris was one of my first guys. Arnold introduced me. We went back to these trade shows, and who's standing here? Billy Mays. So, um, and Billy was from Pittsburgh. I was living in Philadelphia. So we, he was at the show, and there was Billy. And I said to Billy, Billy, we're going to do an infomercial with you. And he said, what's an infomercial? Okay. <laughs> that's how early on in the business we were. This is back in the mid-'80s. So I, that's when I met all the most famous Pitchman in the business, Arnold Morris, Billy Mays, John Park and the little guy with the bow tie where we lit the car on fire and did car waxes. Let's put out the heat. You know, on and on and on. To this day, you, you, you see many of these, these guys, and God bless Billy, he's now passed away. But um, we, we really learned um, how to pitch products from the greatest pitchmen in the world. You weren't only buying media in Cincinnati. You were buying it all across the United States. You must have had some incredible relationships with the, uh, the, the cable companies as well as people who distributed products. Oh, yeah. We, I mean, we went to Lifetime, Discovery, Nashville Network. In fact, Discovery Channel went dark at 3 o'clock in the morning, and they didn't come on until 9 a.m. It was an 18-hour-a-day network. I signed a multi-year contract. It was three, at least a three-year contract with Discovery to own six hours a day, 365 days a year. And that time was generating tens of millions of dollars in sales. So, and they just didn't understand 
to them it was dead time because it was you know they had eight, 18 hours to fill for me this was the birth of, of, of my business and, and took me to an unbelievable level because we then went to other cable networks, basically had relationships with every cable network uh, under the sun. You built this into a company called Quantum Marketing. Correct. Uh, your brother Tim came and joined you. This is the late 1980s. Yes. Am I right? My brother Tim, yeah. Let's talk about your partnership with Tim and building the business together. Yes. Okay, so Quantum, we started uh, with all of the, the great pitch men that I mentioned. Um, Arnold Morris and Billy Mays, et cetera. But um, we were doing houseware products and hardware products and fitness products. And then we met a guy named Tony Little. And Tony Little with the ponytail. And Tony was, you know, the guy with the, you know, now today you, you've seen the gazelle. If I lean forward, I'm uh -huh. working my chest. I'm working my triceps. I'm working the back of my calves. Which is another item. Um, but the, the Ab Isolator and the target training tapes, so we were doing fitness products. We, we got in fitness business. We started... Uh, also doing golf products. Have you ever seen the Medicus Golf Club, the hinged golf club? That product we did in 1991. Number one golf training product, I think, to this day in the golf business. And it's still on the air 22 years later. Um, we did the first ever fishing infomercial, a product called the Flying Lure. So we were really at the beginning of the, of, of, of the industry back, you know, from the early, mid-80s all the way through the 90s to, to uh, and, until I ended up um, you know, so it's a long story. Quantum's growth, but we, we had a we had a great growth, and we had you know obviously a couple of hiccups along the way too. Well, without a doubt, when you have growth, the type of you're talking about, <clears throat> having that much growth creates its own problems. How did you address that learning curve? You, you know, I was good at sales. I was a sales and marketing guy, and. Um, I love dealing with the talent, the production, you know, just there was something fun about television, you know, as it being in the television industry. Um, it was, you know, the entertainment business. We were dealing with celebrities and, you know, really good people. And for the most part, you know, there was a couple celebrities that were tough to deal with. But I ended up bringing on a, a president that was a bank, actually had been the CEO of a local bank. And, um, and, and he came in and said, you know, you, you know, we have to get better contracts and we need to have better projections, we need to have banking relationships, we need lines of credit, and we need this. You know, as a young entrepreneur, I operated more from the seat of my pants than, than you know, forward thinking. And, um, and his whole thing was exit strategy. You know, if you're going to sell this company someday, you know, what do you want to do? You know, you have to plan for your exit when you start the company. And so he's like, look, if someone's going to come along and buy this business, they're going to ask for the document files. And where are all the documents? Where are all the contracts? So we had to go back, and every deal, we had an inventor, we had talent, we had a product owner, we had an inventor, we had this. Every deal had five contracts. Well, if we had 30, 40 deals going, there should be 200 contracts somewhere. Well, they were all over the place. So he brought order to the business, and this was a transition for me that was life-changing. In the early 1980s, when you started getting involved in infomercials, it was a fledgling industry, but competition came on fast. And by the late 1980s, there were a lot of competitors. At that time, you decided to go overseas. What did you find overseas? You know, what was great was just exactly what had happened in the U.S. These, all these new networks that started had to stop at like midnight or 1, 2 in the morning. Same thing overseas. I went into England. I went into Germany. went into Italy, France. All these TV networks shut down at midnight, 1 o'clock in the morning. I just went to them and said, you know what I do in the U.S.? I buy all that downtime, you know, late night. And I went and did the same thing overseas. Just bought up all the airtime in all the markets all across Europe. Kevin Harrington had a You know, we had actually 100 shows that were running in, in the beginning days all across Europe. And that was 100 products that we were carrying inventory in 16 countries. It was mind-blowing, the logistics of all that. So Quantum International became national media. You were with them for a number of years. You yes. built that one up as well. Yes. So, and, and actually, Quantum International merged into national media and then changed into Quantum International again. And that went from $100 million to $500 million in sales. The stock, it was a public company, which was great because we now had lines of credit, and the stock went from a dollar a share to over $20 a share. So it was uh, an exciting time for me uh, to see that, that growth. And this was as we were taking products all around the world into the international market. So um, it was very exciting. We were in Japan, and we were in 
all in Southeast Asia. We were in Latin America. We were all across Europe, um, uh, Eastern Europe, and the Middle East even. Now, in 1994, you formed an innovative partnership with Home Shopping Network, which led to your moving to the Tampa Bay area. Tell us about that. That's, that's why I'm here in Tampa now, t almost 20 years. Um, so Home Shopping Network, think about it. They're a network, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. They sell 50,000 products a year. That's a logistical, you know, I'll call it a nightmare, but for them, it's their business, right? So um, I went to them and said, let's form Home Shopping Network direct. And I don't want to, the 50,000, I want to take your top 200 products. Let's focus on those, Tony Little, Jack LaLanne, et cetera. We're going to take your top performers and do infomercials. Mm -hmm. And so basically we let HSN become the testing grounds for the hot items. And then we took the winners and did infomercials. And that business grew very rapidly um, and nicely uh, right here in Florida starting in 1994, Home Shopping Network Direct. This is the land of so many, it's really the headquarters of electronic retailing because HSN started here and as new executives came in and like, you know, the, the new CEO at HSN, sometimes they bring new people in and then show hosts and buyers and whatever are, you know, out looking for jobs. So you have more talent in this area than you'll ever see in any other marketplace probably in America right here in, in Tampa St. Pete because of Home Shopping Network and all of the people that have been associated with it over the years. A lot of the ex-employees that developed uh, their own businesses now outside of Home Shopping. Now you're the chairman of a company called As Seen on TV. A lot of people recognize that. Tell us about that company. It's my most exciting venture. I love the, the world of As Seen on TV is I've been doing it now 30 years. And we bought the website as seen on TV.com. And um, when you think about it, the, here is it's a logo as seen on TV that is almost branded much like a Coca Cola around the world. And you walk into any store virtually in any country in the world and you'll see the as seen on TV logo. And we own the most powerful intellectual property in that world and it's called as seen on TV.com. And as seen on TV.com is the biggest portal of everything I've seen on TV anywhere in the world, and we get over 15 million visitors coming to that site on an annual basis. So this is, it's a powerful place, if, and, and, and just think of it this way. You watch TV, you saw something, but wait, I didn't get the number? It's okay, come to SCNOTV.com and we have the product. Very exciting business that we're, we're expanding right now. Now you also founded a number of organizations related to the industry, the electronic retailing, Association and the Young Entrepreneurs Organization, or I guess it's called the Entrepreneurs Organization. Yes. Yeah. Tell us about those. Well, ERA, Electronic Retailing Association, in, in our industry, it's, you know, we're, this is um, the $300 billion industry that we're in. And uh, myself and Greg Renker, a couple other folks, uh, back in 1990, we want to have an organization where we can have, an, you know, trustworthy relationships with the media, um, a self policing scenario, because some people, were in those days were saying things that went over the top, went over the edge, weren't honest and weren't legal. So we formed the association. If you're going to be a member, you have to abide by the bylaws. And that meant you can't do things dishonestly. So that was very powerful. And it's, you know, this organization has been around now since 1990. And I'm very proud of the Entrepreneurs Organization. We're in 45 countries. We've got, you know, uh, uh, 17,000 members all around the world uh, from India uh, to um, uh, Moscow, and um, um, it's a networking organization. There's a Tampa chapter and chapters in every major city around the world. So uh, Michael Dell, myself, and a couple of, of entrepreneurs started that organization in 1987. Local guy, Greg Stem from Odyssey uh, uh, Marine is, is one of the co-founders also. In your uh, book, Act Now, you have a chapter called uh, Advice from the Trenches in which you say people really need to open their eyes and not be so limited in their view. Do you think people suffer from that, that they're just not seeing the possibilities that are right in front of them? Uh, absolutely. You know, I think that's one of the things. I, 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 do, a, I do a lot of public speaking and mentoring, and, and I tell people, and I mentioned it earlier, curiosity overload is a word that I, that I use. You know, so many people, they, they just get in a rut, and they just they think that they, you know, they can't, they've got no vision for the future. So if you don't have a vision, that's okay, but 
put yourself into situations where you can find some new things that are going on in your industry. And it's another reason why I subscribe to all these, I, all these catalogs. I get, I get about 1,500 catalogs a year, and I put them into segments of the pet catalogs and hardware and the housewares. And, and so every industry's got its own batch of catalogs, and I, and I get to see the trends and what products are selling in all those industries. So it's, you, know, you can get your mind into finding new things and keeping abreast of the industry. And I, I believe you have to do that as an entrepreneur. Well, you've had a very dynamic and diverse career. What opportunities do you see for you on the horizon? I, I'm mentoring, I'm speaking to a lot of public speaking, but I'm also, I'm on, you know, I'm getting involved with a, a few board of directors of some select companies that, uh, where I think I can have some value and bring something to the table, because I enjoy doing that, but at the same time, that brings some products back to the Ed Seaman on TV guys. So, you know, we, we, we love it all the way around because it, you know, it just kind of comes back in, in, in a circle. Well, Kevin, I want to thank you very much for being our guest. Jeff, it's been a real pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Okay. Thank you. If you'd like to see this interview again or view any of the CEO profiles in our Suncoast Business Forum archive, you can find them on the web at wedu.org slash SBF. Thanks for joining us for the Suncoast Business Forum.